Well, you brought up the, no the notion of maintenance, and I think that we're, we're seeing an increasing role of both consolidation and maintenance therapies uh, in a, a number of diseases that we're going to be talking about today. So I want to turn to John and, and ask, what do you think, uh, you know, in this era, what's the role of, the optimal role of, uh, of c consolidation and maintenance therapy? And, and in particular, we have an exciting uh, plenary presentation that's going to be presented at this year's meeting on the role of abinutuzumab uh, in, in both induction and maintenance therapy. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. So uh, traditionally, or at least most recently, we've referred to maintenance uh, largely uh, in relationship to rituximab treatment. And I think uh, there are two real settings that we have data on that I think are more, more robust. The first uh, is the PRIMA study, which takes patients who, led by Gilles Zal, take, took patients who were treated with either RCHOP or RCVP, went into remission, and then were randomized to observation or two years of rituximab maintenance, showing that there was a progression-free survival benefit, but not an overall survival benefit. And I explain that to patients that uh, it, that PFS benefit helps about 15% of patients, and the other 85% doesn't make a big difference. Uh, so that's how I try to frame it when I speak with patients. So you can decide if that's important or not with respect to PFS. We also have the RESORT study, which looked at rituximab uh, and uh, patients treated with single agent rituximab that Leo referenced and randomized patients to observation and maintenance and showed that retreatment uh, is just as good as maintenance. Uh, and so that questioned in some people's mind in that setting is their value of maintenance versus retreatment. On the other hand, we don't have any real solid data on whether or not you need maintenance after bendamustine in follicular lymphoma or what's the relative risk benefit of that. So that's an unknown and most people or many people have adopted maintenance after bendamustine based on the PRIMA study, but others have said no, it's a PFS benefit, not an overall survival benefit. So that's kind of the state of maintenance and I would say depending on the practitioner, um, you know, a third of patients don't get maintenance, a third do, and a third might, depending on the preferences of the doctor and patient, is kind of how I, I think of it. And, you know, people may skew that a little bit differently. So now we have a new version of rituximab, obinutuzumab, a novel anti-CD20 that has uh, various enhanced properties that seem to make it a be better antibody in some settings make it a little bit more toxic with respect to infusion reactions uh, in some settings. So we have CLL data that we'll come to at some point later showing that it seems to be better uh, than rituximab in that setting. And I think you know, those are pretty clear data, um, but others will comment when we get there. We have data in large cell lymphoma presented at this meeting suggesting that with our chop, is substituting an RCHOP, obinutuzumab doesn't help that much. And then we have follicular lymphoma, and, and as, which is our topic. And so follicular lymphoma, um, single agent comparisons are not that impressive of, of the new antibody versus rituximab. But in the gallium study, patients getting R chemo, or, or I'll call it O chemo for obinutuzumab, were then, so were randomized to one of those approaches, and then had two years of maintenance with whatever they got. So if they got, uh, R chemo, they continued with R maintenance. O chemo continued with O maintenance for two years. And the net of that is that there was a progression-free survival benefit, which is the main uh, feature of that. So I think it's a, clearly a positive study from that endpoint. In my mind, there will be people that will be using it, and there's some value to a progression-free survival benefit. However, on the flip side, it's PFS. It's not overall survival benefit. The toxicity will matter. And the question is, is it sufficiently different that will stop people from using it or sufficiently minor that will let people, you know, say, go ahead, it's not a big deal, adopt the new antibody. And I think um, my sense is that the, the, the antibody-related toxicity is probably not a huge issue for most patients. Um, and then there, there are some interesting things about how will this change practice and will everybody get the new antibody? Will certain subsets of patients get the new antibody? What about the chemotherapy that was chosen and have we learned anything from that? Uh, and, and if I didn't use maintenance before, am I now going to use it on the basis of this study? So a lot of questions. Uh, it's good for patients that we have things that are helping them, but I think that despite the fact that this will be a positive phase three trial, 
there are still some things that make this, if you get into the, the details of the data, perhaps not so clear cut that everybody now is going to get this approach. Because the authors did suggest that this should be the new standard of care on the basis well, of their data. Do you? I think they said a new standard, which is kind of as, as I think everyone around the table likes to, uh, likes to use as a, you know, I think it is a, and I would agree with them that it is a standard. The question will be, you know, not the standard, and, you know, for what patients and, and that. I think, you know, we'll, our community is going to have to decide that, and I think probably if you, if you practice correctly, probably should talk about these things with your patients a little bit too and make them understand and their preferences because, again, it is PFS. It's not overall survival. So I think there is wiggle room for patients. And, you know, to use maintenance in this strategy, you're automatically taking perhaps a four to six month treatment and now making it a two and a half year treatment. And that may just be fine if there's benefit, but for some people that may not work out as being uh, quite so optimal. So. I'd say a couple things, just uh, John mentioned uh, the resort study, which I think is an important trial that really 600 or so patient trial that, uh, which really focused on a group of patients that by definition didn't require treatment. These are patients with very low bulk, asymptomatic disease, and they were then treated. Actually, they were randomized between rituxan alone, four doses, and rituxan lifetime as maintenance. And there was no difference uh, in overall survival and actually a little bit more toxicity, obviously, I've expected in the maintenance group. But what it tells me, though, even though it's an important study, that my conclusion to that is if you take a group of patients that didn't need treatment, more isn't better. <laughs> uh, and, and so not a surprise, I think. Um, uh, it's hard to know what major question it, it answers um, in terms of making decisions about maintenance, maintenance therapy. You did point out, and it's interesting, that despite the lack of data on bendamustine, our bendamustine in maintenance, it was adopted as sort of standard in, that, in, the, uh, in the gallium study. So it's interesting that they sort of extrapolated right to it. And I think yeah. we'll see some fairly robust data on that arm of the study, which will, or that group of patients treated on the study that hopefully will be informative as to, you know, how that approach goes for patients. Right. Well, as you said, it's